Next up on This Week in Law, we've got two great guests, Ben Manovitz and Colin Starger join me. We're going to talk about iPhone 6 and hey, Apple and Google jumping on the NSA proof bandwagon. The monkey selfie photographer stops by again, this time in 3D form. We'll talk about Netflix and VPNs, Microsoft buying Minecraft, lots, lots more next on This Week in Law. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Law is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Twill, This Week in Law with Denise Howell and Evan Brown. Episode 276, recorded September 19th, 2014. Thanks for some of the fish. This episode of This Week in Law is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free! To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash twill. Hi folks, Denise Howell here, and you're joining us for This Week in Law. Really, really fun and exciting panel today. Co-host Evan Brown is going to join us midstream. So uh, just you'll have to wait for Evan, who's always one of the very best parts of the show, of course. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and start the show off live and on time here at 11 o'clock Pacific or a little bit after uh, here in uh, California time and uh, introduce our guests to you and jump right into it. Uh, so today we have Ben Manovitz joining us. Ben has his own law firm, the Manovitz Law Firm in New Jersey, uh, where he focuses on intellectual property law, specifically trademark and domain name stuff. Uh, he has a keen interest in copyright as well, as I think we'll get to in the show. Uh, he's done 10 years at lots of different law firms and also the EFF. So Ben, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks a lot, Denise. It's great to be here. Also joining us this week is Colin Starger. Colin it, teaches at the uh, University of Baltimore School of Law. Uh, where he specializes in civil procedure, uh, criminal procedure, and uh, guilt and innocence, innocence and wrongful convictions. So all those times on the show when we say, gee, we're not really uh, specialists or experts in criminal procedure and search and seizure and all that stuff, Colin is. <laughs> so it's great to have him on the show. <laughs> it's great to be here. Thanks. Wonderful to see you. Um, let's get right into it and talk about uh, an interesting development uh, to our audience and uh, folks who do the kind of thing that we do, the personal audio case, uh, which settled with Adam Carolla, actually went to trial against one of the broadcaster defendants. And of course, that deals with patents. So in the last few weeks, we've been uh, discussing the settlement with Adam Carolla, who raised a bunch of money and was really going to go to the mat on uh, fighting uh, the case against him and the validity of the personal audio patent, which claims to cover activities such as we're engaged in now, syndicating uh, audio and video in various forms. Uh, so, Ben, you've been taking a look at this and I uh, think this is a really bad decision. Can, first of all, for people who aren't up to speed on what happened at the trial, can you tell us who was involved and what did happen? Well, the, I mean, the, the short form is personal audio is a, a, a non-practicing non -practicing entity. They, they acquired this, this patent. Um, I don't really know or remember how. I don't think I was that interested when it first started. But... Um, they acquired the patent. They've been chasing down a number of different players, including Adam Carolla, and uh, particularly in this in this particular uh, moment, uh, CBS, and coming after them for. Well, in this in this instance, they're coming after them for the sort of providing a podcast, uh, making an episodic. It's not necessarily audio episodic computer files available. It's it's the, the claims are the, the last claims in the patent. Um, and there was just a jury verdict that found infringement on the claims that were relevant to the to to this particular case. I think um, what's upsetting, at least to me, what, what bothers me about this case is this this patent is really broad. Uh, really, it, it, I'm, I'm, I keep looking down. I'm flipping to it. I actually pulled the patent. I'm sorry, but it's very broad in that it um, it seeks to it seeks to lay claim to a lot of territory, a lot of 
a lot of uh, it's a land grab um, uh, patent broadcasting your receiving of a of, I'm not patent broadcasting podcast broadcasting receiving a podcast is actually earlier claims you know a mechanism by which to receive essentially a podcast so everybody who got the new iPod, I, iPhone 6 they're all in violation um, they're all infringing it's it's a I think for whatever reason the jury got to this question um, without an adequate determination of the validity of the scope of the patent and I think that's that's the, the biggest concern that I have um, the the CBS put in a rule 50 motion uh, judgment uh, judgment before before verdict I t uh, judgment as a matter of law sorry rule 50 judgment as a matter of law motion before the verdict came in so there's an opening for the judge to issue what's called the JNOV but right now CBS is in a bad position I mean the jury has found it to be infringing there's still a damages component that needs to be gone through so it's not uh, it's not it's not totally done for CBS but it's it's a problem right 1.3 million in damages is what the jury awarded um, CBS is a in some ways a nicer party sorry CBS uh, to have this happen to you than someone like Adam Adam Carolla or, or a smaller uh, person engaged in distributing content episodically uh, because presumably CBS will take this uh, to the federal circuit and challenge the decision um, so it's so that you know we can look down the road to that kind of review of this particular decision. Um, and also EFF is challenging the very broad patent itself uh, at the patent office, and that will continue. Um, ha have you been following the patent challenge itself, Ben? I haven't been following the patent challenge at EFF. It gets very, it's way more technical than, than I normally want to read. Um, mm -hmm. the, there are two, there are sort of two issues though. One is, I think procedurally, there's a question because now that the jury verdict has been brought down in the in the CBS case uh, and if the EFF challenge is successful afterwards um, there's a there's a procedural question as to what that does for CBS so so it, it might end up that uh, you know CBS is still getting mulcted for damages even though the patent is determined to be invalid which I think I think on a on a fair reading of sort of the facts that are available the patent should eventually I mean, I'm not making any predictions because you never know but the patent is probably overbroad and probably anticipated. Um, the problem actually that that uh, CBS had and that the EFF is going to have is with a lot of the a lot of the citations that they're bringing in to claim anticipation and to show to show anticipation or obviousness, they're citations or practices that are not normally or not traditionally understood by the patent office. To be citations, so there's whole sections in uh, in the, for instance, CBS uh, Judgment as a Matter of Law brief that have to convince the court that an online publication is actually a publication adequate for anticipation, or that the practice of a website is a, a practice that can be counted as anticipation or publicly known um, that that suffices to anticipate. It's it's a it's unfortunate. I think it's it's a question of sort of the law having to catch up to the technology. But that said, uh, you know, I think the fact that they have the Rule 50 motion in puts CBS in a good place procedurally, which is a little bit of inside baseball, but it, it opens them up for not paying the damages if the patent is found invalid in another proceeding. Uh, it's good that CBS has the money to defend, and it's, it's really good that the EFF is fighting it, and uh, they are, you know, there's some good people working on that project and they, they know what they're doing, so. Right, and EFF also points out uh, along the lines of uh, taking it up to the federal circuit that, you know, we, should, we shouldn't be too uh, skeptical as to how that might go. Uh, we had Lee Chang on the show uh, who is, you know, the sort of wonderful uh, saber-wielding lawyer at Newegg <laughs> and uh, figuratively or who knows, possibly literally as well. Um, because uh, Newegg challenged a uh, shopping cart patent lost after a five-day trial in the same uh, district, the Eastern District of Texas, but took it up to uh, the federal circuit who found that no reasonable jury could have held that patent valid. So uh, EFF is very much saying, stay tuned, you know, we're, 
stranger things have happened. And, and so we'll just have to watch what happens here. I do think that's really interesting that they've had to brief uh, extensively for the court um, what sort of online or computer-based evidence would be sufficient to um, prove or disprove the patent. Colin, do you have any thoughts on this before we move on? You know, I, I like seeing CBS and EFF on the same team. It's kind of uh, uh, different, uh, but no, no thoughts other than that. Okay, yeah, that is uh, good to note. Uh, they, it, I think, you know, that they sometimes wind up on the same team on uh, fair use kinds of issues as well. Maybe not CBS specifically, but uh, the entertainment industry and EFF. So um, that that is... Uh, Something that's good to see. All right, let's move on. Since everyone is all a buzz, and we already had, uh, if you're watching live here on Friday the 19th, uh, Leo in the studio earlier this morning unboxing the iPhone 6s, uh, we have some good privacy things to discuss along those lines. So let's do it. So last week we were talking about uh, the health component of the iPhone 6s and also uh, the Apple Watch um, and the auto pay functions. And they um, obviously have a host of privacy concerns that we were getting into last week. This week, I'd like to think about the iPhone 6 in a slightly different context, uh, given the um, open letter that Apple put out and various press coverage uh, in its wake about the new encryption that iOS 8 features uh, and the fact that uh, Android phones, at least um, Android phones that will be released in the future, are going to follow suit, uh, which um, means that both kinds of phones will have very strong encryption uh, that reminds me of the show that we did a while back, episode two, 257 with Bruce Schneier, uh, where we were talking about iDrive. I, I had been driving up around uh, the San Francisco area. There was a huge billboard uh, looking out over the 101 freeway coming into San Francisco, touting iDrive as NSA proof. And we got into a big discussion with Bruce Schneier about whether that could really be the case. And uh, also about the whole concept of uh, having secure data in your devices uh, that is somewhat shielded or entirely shielded. And we can get into a, a discussion of, um, you know, how much protection this really offers. Uh, from government intrusion, uh, using that as a marketing tool. And, you know, iDrive was definitely jumping on that, uh, on board with that. And now it appears uh, the big players of Apple and Google are doing the same. You know, this is very much a selling point for Apple uh, that if you're using this operating system, uh, they will not even, they will not be able to respond to government subpoenas asking for information that might be uh, accessible from your device. Um, so that's a big shift from the way things have gone. And it actually um, changes things a bit, even from the, you know, what we thought was a very savvy opinion from the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court in June, uh, holding that a police need a search warrant to uh, begin to access the data on your phone. Um, you know, with this, the, the Washington Post has written, I'll just go ahead and quote it for you. In June, the Supreme Court ruled that the police needed search warrants to gain access to data stored on phones in most circumstances, but that standard is quickly being rendered moot. Eventually, no form of legal compulsion will suffice to force the unlocking of most smartphones. Um, so let's start with Colin. Colin, what do you think about this uh, from the standpoint of criminal procedure and law enforcement? I'm a little conflicted about it, to be honest, uh, Denise. I started off in my first reaction is this is great. Uh, it's another mm -hmm. way to keep the government out of where they shouldn't be. Uh, and it's you know moving in the direction to sort of make the whole question of getting a, a warrant uh, redundant, as was suggested in the article that you spoke about. But then I, I read a couple of things, including a commentary by uh, Orrin Kerr, and he made what I thought was a very interesting point, which is that 
in a way, what Apple has done is thumbing its nose at the whole idea of getting a warrant. In a way, what it's doing is circumventing the law uh, and a lawful process. In other words, when you, when you talk about the Supreme Court's decision last June, the Riley decision, they made what was an excellent unanimous decision saying, if you want to do this, get a warrant. And the old idea that on an individualized case basis, if you have some kind of individualized reason, suspicion, reasonable suspicion that a judge will look at the evidence and determine if there's enough to go forward uh, for a particular prosecution. That's a bedrock principle. And as Fourth Amendment lawyers or criminal defense attorneys are generally want to do everything they can to make the Fourth Amendment and the warrant requirement stronger. Now, by sort of making it redundant or going right around it, the question is raised, if, if only hypothetically, whether they're eroding the, the general principle of uh, forcing the police to act lawfully. And uh, the point has been raised that now it's not like people won't try to to hack uh, through it, uh, hack through these different systems. Uh, the only p the the answer, though, is that doing it through what you would want to be the normal process of getting a warrant, if you're the government, just no longer is done. So it it might potentially encourage illegal behavior. Like I say, I'm conflicted. I'm not totally buying that argument, but I do think it raises an issue that you need to think about. Do we want to do things to force the government to act in line with the old way, which may still be a good way, which is if you have a decent suspicion, you need a warrant. Uh, if we get rid of all of the incentives to even have a warrant at all, it might have ripple effects in other areas of the law that, that might not be good. Can I just is there question? any recourse on the part of law enforcement against Apple and Google if they do this? Can, can, you know, states or the federal government come in and enact laws and say, you need to be able to uh, allow us to serve a warrant and get that data? That This is a step too far in um, guarding user privacy, um, security. We understand your impetus for it, uh, but it keeps us from doing our jobs. Do you, do you expect that we might see some sort of legislation along that lines? I can I can very much imagine uh, a desire to push legislation along those lines, and depending on who leads that charge, it could be some horrible legislation, like we've seen with the Patriot Act or other uh, extremely oppressive pieces. Uh, and certainly, Congress can do sort of whatever it wants in the legislative arena. Just how constitutional it is will have to be decided when there's a challenge brought to that law. Uh, although, you know, the the average bet is that the laws are upheld. So um, that's not to say that if they if they draft a particularly draconian one, I think that as a if it just was standing on a blank slate, Google or Apple in this particular case, Apple, but likely soon Google, given the, the way it's being marketed, as you pointed out earlier, um, they have every right to to do whatever they want to their own device. Um, uh, the uh, the it's their own property, they can they can send it out into the world however however they want but the argument will be put forward that these things you know they are they they you know they go out a lot of the data is goes over public kind of networks or lines that what's in the public there's some public right to know that you know the the law can get a little bit murky and there's certainly um, uh, the idea that it's just Apple's property or just Google's property or just the individual's property can be challenged because of uh, the way the packets get sent hither and yon. So I think there are weaknesses there. And I think that uh, the way that you introduced this segment by saying, uh, referring back to an earlier conversation about how uh, the marketing at play here is kind of odd, I think you have to think that they reasoned with the marketers before they reasoned with the people thinking about the long-term stability of, you know, U.S. law enforcement, which is unsurprising. Right. Uh, uh, ben, do you think this is uh, good or potentially dangerous? Well, I don't, I mean, good and potentially dangerous is a hard, is a hard, it's a harder question than I want to answer right now. Um, mm -hmm. I think. Maybe it's a little of all, both. It's a little bit of both. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's like any Fifth Amendment, you know, you always get the, the horrible case situations that you can oh if, if only the police could have done that and 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 they could have found out and they could have saved it's always children they save children um and then on the other hand there's you know i would like to be able to walk down the street and not 
I am used to the civil liberties as a, as a citizen of the United States. I'm used to certain civil liberties and I feel, uh, I feel invaded when those are trampled. So there's a, there's a balancing act. I, just, uh, two quick sort of one, one point and one question, which is, uh, Android, there was just an announcement in the past day or two that the next version of Android is going to do the same thing. So it is now Google and, uh, you know, iOS, right. they're both, they're both doing that. And, um, wasn't there, a, wasn't there a situation? Oh, there we go. And wasn't there a situation um, like two years ago when it came up, could the, the courts force you to give up your password? So I don't know necessarily how, how that would play in in terms of Fifth Amendment concerns because if, I, if you can't obtain the data without a warrant, which is great, um, and now with a, presumably with a warrant or presumably with some sort of judicial intervention or, or decision making, they can force you to give up password. I think that sort of obviates the concern. I think what's really happening here is both Google and um, and Apple are 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 offloading the responsibility. They're saying we no longer want to be the good guys or the bad guys. We're going to give you the ability to protect your own data, and you know if you don't like what the government's doing, that's between you and the government. I also think there's there's you know there's still the open question that even though the phones themselves are encrypted, the you know the cloud backups of those are still if they are encrypted, they're still under the control of the of the parent company. I mean, the encryption is unless the encryption is, you know, unless unless iCloud, I don't use iCloud, unless iCloud, you know, gives you a, a password and and Google doesn't have that that ability to. I mean, I'm sorry, then Apple doesn't have that ability to. Decrypt I think what's that's what the, Apple's claiming. I, you know, I even in the again, cloud. I think that they are claiming that your cloud. Yes, here and here's the open me message from Tim Cook. Security and privacy are, this is reading from it, security and privacy are fundamental to the design of all our hardware, software, and services, including iCloud and new services like Apple Pay. Um, so, you know, he's definitely lumping it in with this message that we're going to secure your data. Um, and then um, there are some detailed sites to go to from there at the end of his open letter. Um, but, you know, I correct me if I'm wrong, chat room or anyone else, but uh, I, I am assuming that Apple is trying to put the onus, as, as you were suggesting, Ben, um, you know, that they want to get out of being in the evidence providing business, right. um, that they want to make that relationship direct between law enforcement and their customers, which does get us into the, okay, under what circumstances can the government force you to turn over your decryption key. And we have a bit of a split on that in the U.S., don't we, uh, Colin? I believe we do, I'll, although I'll admit that I haven't studied that case law recently. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, when it comes down to it, there, you're, you're, you can be held in contempt for not doing it, um, for not providing the password if you've been ordered to do so. But the government isn't going to actually be able to force you to do it. So I think Ben raises, I mean, physically force you to do it. They're not, they haven't, uh, that level of uh, sort of violence has not been authorized, thank goodness. I think Ben raises a, a really good point, uh, and, and you echoed it first about just trying to get out of the business and uh, leave it to between law enforcement and the citizens directly. Uh, but second, when he was referring to the kind of the the two competing scenarios, you know, the ticking time bomb scenario where you need to get in a phone to stop a bomb that's going to blow up some you know innocents or, as he said, children. Uh, and then on the other hand, what the government often normally does or often, depending on how you view government, uh, spying on people that they shouldn't be spying on at all. And in some ways... It comes down to how you, what your presumption is. Uh, if you have a, a rosy view of what government does and you think generally they're in the business of stopping the ticking time bombs, or if you have a more cynical view that thinks they're much more interesting and interested in, in snooping for reasons that are uh, dubious at best. Uh, and there I tend to fall on the side of the dubious at best, which is why uh, after after this discussion, I'll, I'll go back to thinking this is probably a good move. Like I said, right from the beginning, <laughs> I admitted I was conflicted, so had to go around the merry-go-round on that one. That's right. Um, do you think it makes a difference, Colin, uh, if law enforcement, uh, you know, what what technology is being used to encrypt the data that law enforcement wants to get at? And I'm specifically thinking of a passcode versus um, some sort of biometric. 
So that's a good I, Well, I think it would make a difference on the ground, right? It's going to be a, uh, if there's a biometric, the case law is pretty clear. And uh, there's another case that's going to be probably heading up to the Supreme Court now that you can take uh, DNA from, for example, two terms ago, Maryland versus King, you can just upon being arrested, the police can take your DNA from the inside of your cheek with a buckle swab and throw it in a database to see if you've committed any other crimes. The way that opinion was written, unlike Riley, which was the cell phone warrant case, Riley was a 9-0 case. Maryland versus King was a 5-4. It was much more contentious. Uh, and Justice Scalia wrote the dissent in that case. And as he very correctly pointed out, the line that they attempted to draw in Maryland versus King, that it was about an arrest for something serious, that line isn't going to hold up at all. So what that means is that really there's no uh, decent constitutional barrier in place right now for the police on any kind of suspicion at all taking somebody's DNA. If they take the DNA and can use that to gain access biometrically, it's quite different from a passcode. So I think practically it would make a big difference. Uh, I think similarly it might be pretty, I wouldn't let you uh, torture somebody to get their password, but they probably wouldn't be a lot of barriers in place for forcing them to put their finger on a screen to unlock it. Hmm. There'd be plenty of legal challenges, but I, I've, I suspect that they, once whatever they got that was in the phone uh, by forcing them to put their fingerprint there once they got it and that came out and they saved the baby or stopped the ticking time bomb the courts would somehow find a way to justify it right uh, saving children always as ben said comes up um can i ask you if from your lens of uh spending a lot of time considering wrongful convictions and what sort of evidence makes good evidence do you think this kind of development will contribute to the wrongful conviction problem because it's going to be harder for law, law enforcement to get the evidence that they think might prove or disprove? The Fourth Amendment falls into a funny place in wrongful conviction law. Uh, there, it does, Generally speaking, when you look at the causes of long, wrongful conviction, the big ones are eyewitness misidentification, which definitely doesn't come under the Fourth Amendment, really junky forensic science, which really doesn't come under the Fourth Amendment, and police misconduct, which generally speaking doesn't come under the Fourth Amendment. The great irony of the Fourth Amendment is that it's there to protect people. Ultimately, it's there to protect people that aren't engaged in criminal activity. Uh, however, in order for those protections to be there, you have to protect people that are engaged in criminal activity. Just by its very nature, you're not going to have a challenge to uh, uh, evidence being gathered uh, by the police being challenged under Fourth Amendment grounds that they should have gotten a warrant or they shouldn't have got it at all, unless somehow it's incriminating. So most of the Fourth Amendment cases that go all the way up to the Supreme Court generally involve people who have evidence of guilt that's been found by violating the Fourth Amendment. And the question is, given that the police didn't know that's what it was going to show ahead of time, should they have been allowed to do it in the first place? And the interest at heart is thinking about, well, what if it was actually an innocent person? Do you see what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. so uh, I tend not to think that this kind of uh, warrantless activity, the main problem is that it's going to lead to more wrongful convictions. The main problem is that it leads to erosion of civil liberties. What we need to do to correct wrongful convictions is another conversation. It's one I'm very willing and happy to have. I just don't think it's going to turn around saying strengthening the Fourth Amendment will uh, stop wrongful convictions or seriously slow them down, except in, this, in the extent that it tells police that they have to follow the rules. And if you have a strong Fourth Amendment, it tells police they have to follow the rules. Generally speaking, that translates to less wrongful convictions because when you see police or prosecutors – violating the rules or acting as if they are the law unto themselves, a lot of times then you do have uh, the wrongful convictions that follow. So at a, at a cultural level, it makes sense. But analytically, the Fourth Amendment and wrongful convictions, to me, don't go together, uh, except in the false confession arena. And, and again, that's more Fifth Amendment. Okay. Hey, before we leave this topic of uh, whether you can... Uh, NSA proof your phone entirely. I wanted to highlight an email that we got after episode 257 with Bruce Schneier. Uh, Bruce was skeptical when I asked him uh, whether 
you could really, really accomplish what iDrive was claiming on its billboard to be NSA proof. Uh, his quote was, they would be the first comp company, company, and company, and company in the history of mankind if there were no there flaws were no in their security to, to really be able to make it NSA proof. Uh, our listener slash viewer, Abby Becker, took issue with that and sent me a long email um, about uh, his take on encryption techniques and thought that, you know, if someone really were to think about it and do it right, you could make a product that was NSA proof. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. It was a very lengthy email. Uh, but his point was just to push back on that notion that it couldn't be done. And also to highlight episode 448 of Security Now, where Steve Gibson talked a lot about Apple's keychain cloud storage system having two different encryption systems, uh, one used for everything uh, and very, very strong. And a second encryption system uh, that was, uh, he, according to Abby, does not seem to have any purpose and is clearly weak. Uh, so I'm not quite sure what the point is there, uh, but he, he does think that um, you could do it if you wanted to. And if, if, you know, it seems that Apple and Google want to do it. So we'll um, have to see exactly how this all plays out. And I think we'll put our first MCLE passphrase into the show and make it NSA proof in honor of this discussion. If you are a lawyer or another professional who is listening to the show and uh, desirous of getting professional continuing legal or other education credit, uh, we have some information for you over at our wiki at wiki.twit.tv. Uh, and we put these passphrases in the show in case you have to demonstrate to your oversight body that you did in fact listen or watch the show. So uh, if you're doing that, we, uh, we thank you. We think it's a good idea. We think we have all kinds of good educational uh, material and wonderful folks like Professor Starger joining us today. Right now, what I'd like to do is take a break and thank our sponsor for this episode of This Week in Law, and that is Personal Capital. Personal Capital is a free and secure tool that solves two barriers to growing your wealth. The first barrier is that it's hard to keep track of. Stocks, 401ks, bank accounts, etc. they're all on different sites. They have different usernames and passwords. The second is that you pay someone to manage your money, and you're probably paying too much. Personal Capital brings all your accounts and assets on a single screen on your computer, phone, tablet with real time and intuitive graphs. Personal Capital has an award winning watch app that you can download in Google Play that seamlessly integrates with Personal Capital on other Android devices and provides users with relevant and timely updates on their finances whenever and wherever they need it. Personal Capital shows you how much you're overpaying in fees and how to reduce those fees. You also get tailored advice on optimizing your investment. Think of it as Priceline for your investment fees. So why wait? Signing up takes just a minute and it'll pay big dividends. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. So to set up your free account, go to personalcapital.com slash twill. Personal Capital is free and the smart way to grow your money. Thank you so much, Personal Capital, for your support of This Week in Law. Um, so let's see, let's move on. So kind of pivot from this, not quite out of the privacy arena, but a little sideways to it, certainly still in the constitutional arena. Uh, there was an interesting article again by Oren Kerr, who we mentioned before in the Washington Post, um, con uh, concerning the Silk Road prosecution and, uh, the data that is being, used there and how it was obtained. And this is a particular interest to Oren Kerr because he represented uh, the, he represented Weave, I'm forgetting his actual name, W-E-E-V, uh, in, in a similar case uh, involving uh, something that was left openly available on the web, a security hole that was not closed that was exploited to find information. Weave was prosecuted for it. Here the FBI has defended using research tactics like this, evidence gathering tactics like this, uh, in order to prosecute Ross Ulbricht uh, for the Silk Road activities. Um, so what Oren Kerr's point is, uh, is that it's quite interesting for the Department of Justice on the one hand to say, 
there was nothing constitutionally violative about what we did. We found, you know, we found this uh, IP address that was leaking from the site due to a misconfiguration and uh, anybody could have found it. And we just gathered whatever information we could from the web, uh, which is precisely the argument that uh, was asserted uh, on Weave's behalf in his case. His case wound up uh, falling uh, not uh, convicting him on completely other grounds. I think it was a venue-related issue, a totally procedural issue that didn't get to the heart of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, which uh, is ultimately uh, what Weave was accused of violating. Um, so I thought this was a pretty interesting juxtaposition. I don't know if it's more than just a thought experiment, but uh, do you think the DOJ... Colin has sort of tied one hand behind their back if they want to uh, once again try and prosecute someone under the CFAA for happening upon information that was not adequately secured. I think uh, I think they have tied it a little bit. This is a what started off. I think Oren's article starts off very much like a thought experiment, and you've raised exactly the right question: is it's not about what happened in the Silk Road prosecution and can they do that, although we should get into that a little bit, but it's more about well, what does this say going forward in a way, because in a way this is a classic argument from hypocrisy. You can't say A and then do not A later, right? But uh, the, the, the question is, well, when you resolve a hypocrisy, you can kind of choose one side or the other. You could say that Weave's actions were perfectly fine under the analysis that they're giving uh, in, the, in the present Silk Road case. Or you could say that neither Weave's actions were fine nor uh, are the Silk Road actions fine. However, you know, taking the side of law enforcement just for a second, which is not something that I instinctively do, they would they would point to two things, and Orrin points to one of them. Uh, the CFAA specifically has a law enforcement mm -hmm. exception. So if you are doing things that would otherwise violate the CFAA in pursuance of a lawful investigation, you're off the hook. So they could point to that. As Orrin points out in his article, they didn't actually do that here, but they, they didn't need to. But the second thing they would say, listen, law enforcement breaks the law all the time in order to catch lawbreakers. You wouldn't say that police can't speed to catch speeders, uh, so why can't they sort of hack about to catch hackers is, is, the, is the argument in, an, in a nutshell. I'm not entirely convinced though in this case that their position, uh, which isn't articulated as, as well as, as Oren did or you did or even I did uh, in their briefing, uh, wouldn't have some consequences going forward. They seem to suggest that publicly available data, if you just sleuth about, uh, it's not hacking, right? Sleuthing is not violating the CFAA. You're just looking at what's there. So I do think at least a creative lawyer, creative criminal defense lawyer, if faced with the prosecution of his or her client under the CFAA in the future, should at least try to raise this. Uh, I would have no doubt that the criminal authorities would immediately point to the law enforcement exception in there. But it does, you know, it raises the general question about government lawbreaking or government reckless activity. Uh, in his classic dissent many, many years ago before wiretapping was illegal, uh, an Olms the Olmstead case, Justice uh, Brandeis said that government should set an example. They shouldn't violate the law, not just because it's against the law, because what example does that send? And while perhaps we should tolerate it with some a, a policeman driving you know, 75 miles an hour to catch a 70 mile an hour speeder, they shouldn't drive so recklessly as to put other people in danger. The analogy isn't perfect here, but I do think you know, it, raises, it raises some deeper issues that we should think about. Well, I th can I just... I think the question is made a little bit subtle um, only because the actual CFAA violation or the, or the actions by the federal government in sleuthing, which I think that's an awesome distinction. I think that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to totally adopt that, the sleuthing versus what was it, the hacking, I think. So I think the <laughs> sleuthing that they did was um, it would have been a violation if done by a civilian to another website under the CFAA, only under a very sort of 
expansive reading of the CFA. In other words, the, the federal, the government, what they did was they took information that was leaking publicly. It wasn't that they actually hacked in, is that there was some sort of information that was around, sort of around the edges of the protected information. But it was clearly intended, clearly intended by the Silk Road people to be secret. And they, they capitalized on that information. That action of, of capitalizing on public information that was intended to be secret, that is in the CFFA, CFAA. And I'm not sure if it's actually in the statute or only by sort of judicial interpretation, but it's a it's it's a it's a very subtle question because it's not it's not so clear like on a on a close textual reading of the CFAA what they did would not have been would not have been over the line. What the federal, what the government did, would not have been over the line, except for this. It was intended to be private, exception, and that is that that makes the question a lot closer because it's it's much more about sort of what Silk Road was putting out there. And and I think I think you correctly hit it actually in the in the discussion we just had is that you know questions like this always come up in the context of bad guys, but they're really meant to protect good guys or. That, that's an oversimplification, but and and that's I think the, a, a similar problem here is that, that I'm I'm a brown coated heart. I don't think Silk Road is a bad guy, <laughs> but uh, but you know a little bit further. But um, but on the assumption that the sort of the, the legal establishment generally will have that Silk Road is a is a bad actor of some sort, then you're faced with this problem where where the government engaged in a behavior that was arguably not over even the the line set by the cf c i'm i'm saying that wrong cfaa or whatever um right and and i mean arguably not even over that line. and then of course there is the 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 fact that the cfa itself has exceptions for law enforcement and things like that so it's just it's just yeah. a tighter question than i think we've been, we've been giving it credit for well the pr the problem though is cfaa and again colin would be more versed on this than than i am but uh seems to have a history or rather a notorious reputation of being expansively read by prosecutors um, to, to terribly dire effect. So right. that, you know, for them to take the stance, for the Department of Justice to take the stance that um, doing something uh, akin to what they did here uh, was not, and again, they did not bring up the CFAA, I think, in their briefing. Um, they were all about the Fourth Amendment and whether they were acting constitutionally. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the issue is a prosecutor uh, might read this entirely differently than Orrin Kerr would. Do you concur, Colin? Absolutely. And, uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that this story we're even discussing this story because Oren made a connection that he could because mm -hmm. he defended Weave. Uh, and he said, well, that's because the, the government in this case, the Silk Road case said our actions are entirely lawful. And he uh, said to himself, Oren said to himself, well, that's not the position you took at all in my case, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I don't know if it, uh, it makes sense to, to uh, go to one of the other cases that you have put in the, in the potential rundown because it just reminds me of it. Um, I can sure, allude to it. Let's Perhaps go to I it. Could return to it. What, uh, what's it reminding you of? That was the anti-shredding case, the Sarbanes-Oxley prosecution. <laughs> uh, yes, let's right. talk about that. Because, because that's another I wasn't another sure where we were going to fit that in. And, oh. and pre preservation of fish, it's, I think it's very important to talk about. It's, uh, you know, it's prosecutors gone wild, you know. It's this exact <laughs> phenomena of prosecutors Sorry. very, very aggressively reading a statute, um, if not incredibly creatively, to find some room to prosecute. Uh, and this story, the Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, the basic outlines of which involved a guy that was fishing, and uh, and he got a number, I think, 72 fish that were he wasn't allowed to catch because of the particular fishing regulations. And uh, and the Fish and Wildlife Service said, we're going to write you a ticket. Um, uh, forgive me if I'm uh, messing the facts up a little bit. But basically, they said that. And when uh, they said, we'll write it to you back at the port. And when they arrived back at the port, he only had 69 fish instead of 72. And they said, you've destroyed some of the evidence. And uh, a prosecution was actually brought 
against him under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which is generally reserved for, uh, as the article that you've got up on the screen right now, for cases of massive financial misconduct by institutions like Enron. Uh, and this is the so-called anti-shredding provision that our, our man with the fish uh, or the two fish missing was prosecuted <laughs> under. And uh, what happened was the one of the lines of the particular section of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act prohibits destroying, uh, among other things, any tangible object. And I have no idea how this brilliantly creative and yet inc aggressively wild prosecutor thought, hey, I'm going to get this fish guy under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And he went <laughs> and he read it. And he said, it's it not the first yeah. thing that comes to mind. No, it's, it's, I don't, you know, again, I, I don't know if he just happened to have been doing a Sarbanes Oxley prosecution the week before. It seems highly unlikely. Uh, That's a CLE uh, class. Yeah. He took a CLE <laughs> class, and some, some speaker in the CLE class was like, you could even use it for, you know, any kind of evidence. And, and he just wrote that down in his little book, and he's waiting for that. He's waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, if you're if you're an absolute literalist, he's got a fantastic argument. And in fact, so far that prosecution has withstood scrutiny from the court. But if you think the intent of Congress matters even just a little bit, then it seems uh, completely wild that this guy should be prosecuted under this statute. But prosecutors have a huge amount of power. That's something that I see all the time in my wrongful convictions work. And when prosecutors act well, uh, it's incredibly incredible how much easier things can go. I just had a case out of Dallas, Texas, where I work as a, a special assistant to the Dallas, Texas Conviction Integrity Unit. And that case went swimmingly uh, because we had the prosecution, uh, uh, the uh, rather the cooperation of the prosecutors. But when prosecutors dig in their heels or come up with these aggressive theories, it's hard to stop them. So is anyone else just stunned that this is actually going to be heard by the Supreme Court? This is it does, not, does it go I all mean, the way to the Supremes? I think so. <laughs> I think uh, that's how it hit my radar. Let me let me fact check myself on that. Yeah, I think on this article it says that you know he's he's got the court capitalized. So so for me I'm saying yes. Um yeah. I think I mean here's the question. If we took out the Sarbanes Oxley component, which is generally a you know, generally thought of as connecting with, um, you know, financial crimes and Enron and things like that. There is, I, I, I hate to come down on the fish guy, but there, there was some sort of destruction of evidence, whether or not I think it qualifies as, I, I, I mean, whether or not it falls under that particular sort of umbrella of Sarbanes, of Sarbox is, is a, is a different question if that's the correct way to go about it. But there was arguably an, you know, evidence being destroyed and then, you know, some sort of wrongdoing. I don't know that bringing under Sarbox, you know, increases the the downside, and I think that's the issue. I think if the if the downside of of just you know anti shredding under Sarbox is under Sarbanes Oxley is 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 worse, then there's your problem. I think there was, however, some sort of evidence destruction, which you know is 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 a problem in the criminal context. You know, my my uh, my tendencies aside. There, there are reasons for enforcement of, of laws. Uh, Talk amongst <laughs> yourselves for a second. I'm still fact-checking whether this I, uh, particular I, uh, cert petition, which was filed, yeah, I think it's just, uh, got I think granted. The, I think the article is about the about the cert petition being filed, so I, okay. I don't know if it, it still could be granted, but I don't think it has yet. Okay. Let's see. I have just... I have overview of the U.S. Supreme Court's October 2014 term. Let's see if Yates shows up as something. It's Colin, Colin, I just want to know where um where on the map fish law is going to go. Uh, where on the Supreme <laughs> Court? You're going to have a whole section, a whole new branch of fish law. <laughs> yeah, we'll call it a a new current of Supreme Court doctrine. Oh, please, please, really? Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, <laughs> You're uh, you're embarrassed even to be on the same show as me right now. I'm embarrassed. The same. The same. I, I'm trying to think of a clever fish pun, and I'm not coming up with it timely, which is disappointing to me and everyone. All everyone, my friends, who is going to eventually watch this because they expect it. So but I found an article by Elizabeth Slattery, Slattery at Heritage, and she is saying that uh, this is part of the 2014 term. 
that the okay. court, she says, uh, anyone who uses Facebook to pays taxes, enjoys fishing, drives a car, or uses railroads should take note of the upcoming Supreme Court term. <laughs> the justices will review cases touching on these and other important issues during the court's term beginning on October 6, 2014. So it appears to have been granted. We will hear more on fish. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. I will, I will add this to our discussion points at delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 276, where you can read Elizabeth's rundown of all those interesting cases coming before the court and everything else that we've touched on and will touch on in the show today. Um, one other privacy-related story I just wanted to mention, uh, largely because it gives me the opportunity to use another um, good MCLE passphrase when we're done discussing it. Um, but it's interesting too. It's uh, uh, in California, we have a law um, that will uh, become law if the governor does not uh, take any action to veto, veto it very soon here. Um, it will come into effect uh, January of next year. And its acronym is SOPIPA. So apparently the California lawmakers uh, have no fear of unpopular federal legislation that didn't pass. <laughs> and this is the uh, Student Online Personal Information Protection Act. And its purpose is uh, to rein in what can be done with data about students um, as more and more technology is used in schools. Um, so this would extend to um, any and all uh, databases that schools maintain on things like behavior, um, things like email, uh, you know, all, any sorts of student data would get uh, protection under this new California law. California, as we've discussed on the show before, tends to have uh, pretty extensive privacy-based laws, personal privacy-based laws. And this looks to be another one joining the fray. So, um, so PIPA will be our second MCLE passphrase for the show, S-O-P-I-P-A. Uh, any thoughts on this, Colin? You know, I think you, it's it's great to see the challenge of dealing with big data, um, you know, taken up straightforwardly as the California legislature has done. You're you're much more familiar with what happens out there and and kind of the trend. So I can't I can't fit it into a bigger picture. Uh, but I think, you know, you have to, and it's it's no accident that we're seeing it start. Uh, in this uh, kind of more comprehensive way with children because they're among the most vulnerable and uh, the ones where people can can easily think of scenarios where it'll be misused, uh, you know, overly aggressive tracking uh, or or health kind of issues. Um, you know, I, the only the only place where I think uh, it might um, you know, it might backfire, and, and here I'm being completely sarcastic. Is uh, it might stop people? It might somehow help people from not vaccinating their children around Hollywood. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but as perhaps I shouldn't have even said that. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We're those are some of the best moments of the show. <laughs> um, any any thoughts, Ben? Before we move on. <laughs> I mean, I don't think, I think the unfortunate acronym is the, the biggest problem with this is that it's going to get tied <laughs> into the, the various, you know, SOPA and other, other, other legislation or legislative pushes. This, right. this is, it's not tremendously controversial, you know, don't give away children's information, don't make it marketable. Um, it's going to face the same sort of problems technically that a lot of legislation in this field uh, comes up against, which is how are you going to technically make that happen if you're a if you're a provider of a certain service and that service is provided not only to schools but also to the general public now mm -hmm. you have to basically flag each account and say oh well i'll just answer my question flag each account and say this yeah. one is a child in the school and this one's not and then there's it just it just it doubles the work it doubles the sort of le regulatory compliance that you have to engage in that said um you're going to that's why I think that's where the friction is going to happen. The friction is going to happen where you have technical problems making this, make it complying with this law. The law itself doesn't seem that tremendously horrible. Um, right. From my People like Google who are offering a specific product for educational purposes, um, they might have an easier time complying, although they've certainly tripped over themselves uh, with um, 
their email product for schools already. Uh, that right. may be part of part of why we're um, seeing this kind of legislation in the first place. But um, there, there's also a companion piece of legislation that I haven't looked at very closely that that deals with the vendors themselves and and what you know if you are selling to schools, what sort of um, steps you have to take. Uh, so I, we'll we'll probably see more shakeout on this uh, early next year when, as you say, Ben, um, people who offer services that schools are using. And of course, oftentimes the uh, software vendor doesn't have any control right. over who its customers right. are. What are they going to do, right? Eh, this, is, this could be a bad um, uh, outcome of this kind of legislation. They may just have to write into their terms of service that the, this piece of software is not for educational use because we don't want to deal with the headaches and problems of maintaining that data, you know, like we see uh, so many services who won't uh, even touch children under 13 because of the requirements of COPPA. Um, do, you, do you think that that could happen uh, as an unintended consequence of this, Colin? I'm, I'm going to leave this one to you and Ben. You have a, a much better handle on it than I do, <laughs> to be honest. All righty. So that's just my, my hesitation. And uh, I will look for, I don't know if uh, Professor Goldman, Eric Goldman has written on this yet, yet, but I know he will have good thoughts on it and we'll highlight them as soon as uh, I figure out what they are. Um, let's move on to uh, Hollywood and the entertainment arena. All right, apologies to you both. If you're not as interested in this story as I am, we touched on it briefly last week uh, when it was still in the rumor stage that uh, Mojang was gonna get purchased by Microsoft. Uh, that purchase has since happened, $2.5 billion later. Uh, and, you know, tiny little but very popular juggernaut game company uh, purchased by juggernaut Microsoft. Um, so, my my fear and why it came up uh, last week uh, is is the um, different take on uses of the intellectual property that uh, a small independent game developer like Mojang might have versus Microsoft. Um, and Microsoft has made several noises uh, that are encouraging, but certainly um, don't take into account or address the whole world of wild and wooly intellectual property use, uh, you know, unlicensed specifically, um, that makes Minecraft what it is. You know, if, if for those of you who don't play Minecraft or don't have children who play Minecraft, um, it is a very enjoyable game that stand alone, you can get a lot out of. But the reason that it is the powerhouse that it is, the reason that it's getting purchased for $2.5 billion is because of the very open approach towards intellectual property use that Mojang has taken and has allowed so many different types of uh, things to be done with the game, um, different server, you know, anything you can imagine uh, exists in Minecraft, including all manners of unauthorized trademarks, uh, storylines, you name it. It's it's an IP lawyer's, you know, it's certainly an IP prof professor's fantasy exam question. Um, so we, we still don't know what will become of that. Uh, Microsoft has definitely made noises about how, you know, despite the fact it's it's already an Xbox game and they it will continue to be that they will continue to make it available on other platforms as well, which is, you know, a nice twist for Microsoft. Um, and so I just wanted to toss it out there again. If this just isn't anybody else's cup of tea, we can move on to other things. But uh, Ben, do you find this interesting at all? Um, the, the only the only comment I think I have to add is, um, do you remember, I think it was two years ago when Yahoo bought Tumblr? Um, yes. There was a concern then and I think the concern is is here now. I have some. I have only a very sort of tertiary contact with Minecraft, but there is a a society. There is a whole atmosphere. There's a whole gestalt that exists in Minecraft that I I'm 
I am not personally concerned, but I can understand the concern of someone who lives in that world that now Microsoft is going to come in and stomp on that. And as long as Microsoft sort of respects that that uh, biosphere, that ecology that has been developed there, and leaves it alone, then I think everyone's happy. Microsoft is happy because that's to, it's actually going to get what it bought, and um, the Minecraft world will be happy because it'll be left alone. Um, if Microsoft takes over and then sends in its lawyers and starts, you know, whatever you do, driving, flying, whatever you do around Minecraft and sort of pointing to things mainly, you know, that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem, then, you know, then it is to be hoped that another Minecraft will spring up somewhere, but this one will be crushed. I, I and then, and Microsoft will lose out because it'll lose what it was purchasing. I don't think well, they'll care. I think they're worried about being sued. The, the problem is that Microsoft can have the best of intentions of maintaining this ecosystem that has thrived and sprung out and put out so many thousands of tendrils. Uh, but Microsoft makes a far more attractive target for litigation right. um, than Mojang did. And so in, in order to just, you know, put up a shield around themselves, they may ha feel compelled to do something about worlds based on Harry Potter and SpongeBob and other people's game technology. Uh, what, what am I thinking of? There, there's, I think, just a plethora of Call of Duty servers um, <laughs> in Minecraft. Uh, just, you know, you name it, it's there. Um, so, Colin, do you think that they will have to be the bad guy on the IP front simply in self-defense? Yeah, well, there's nobody that has deeper pockets than Microsoft or very few people. So uh, I imagine there's some lawyers who are already licking their chops thinking, OK, this is a pretty good target now. Um, and uh, and although we might instinctively think, OK, Microsoft, they're going to be the ones that kill awesome. Maybe somebody else is going to try and kill awesome and Microsoft has to play defense. So, uh, you know, you're you're certainly better suited to, to discuss the IP issues than I am, but it does strike me that, that the game changes when uh, the deep pocket at the other end is Microsoft as opposed to the you know a, a small little Swedish company. Um, yeah. On a totally separate side note, but I am somewhat familiar with the game because I have a nine-year-old child. And uh, as on an aesthetic note, I just love the fact how well this thing has done. It shows that, uh, you know, the you don't need those high highfalutin graphics to have a compelling game. It reminds, I've always thought that from right. from way back when it was all about the the how interesting the interface was, not just how sexy the graphics were. And this is stands as living proof of that. So I I'm happy for the company. I think they've got a great a great game. Yeah, me too. And and they've been touting, you know, the nine year old sweet spot is definitely there. And they've been touting the the educational benefits of the game and the fact that, you know, we're getting back to what software is used in schools. I have definitely read reports of Minecraft being used in schools as sort of an analytic tool. And, um, you know, Microsoft loves the fact that uh, kids like it and the parents like it because it's an iterative, imaginative create kind of space. Um, so, you know, again, it's just a question of how well they'll be able to preserve uh, the universe that exists now, which has a very, uh, you know, hands-off approach to taking any steps to quelch users' desire to use other people's intellectual property in the game. Um, Anybody interested in the fact, again, this is one we can skip if it's just not, you know, fascinating to either or both of you. Uh, but I do think it's um, worth noting it will be important to lots of people globally uh, that there has been, again, this is just sort of a tacit thing that has happened and enforcement has been possible and not really cracked down on that Netflix you know, the U.S. version of Netflix is only supposed to be available to persons with a U.S. IP address um, that is very easily circumventable with a VPN. And there are probably, I don't know the numbers, but thousands of people around the world uh, exploit that loophole daily. Uh, the entertainment industry has now... Uh, told Netflix we're, we're going to uh, put a stop to that. 
they want to ban uh, VPN ser services um, that allow access to Netflix. And they're somehow, I mean, they call it piracy when you're, when you're accessing from an unauthorized IP address. Okay, I, I kind of get where you're going for there, just like it's piracy to have a movie uh, that plays on your different region DVD player, you know, the, all of the various ways that um, the entertainment industry tries to window and segment off who can see what when. Uh, this seems to be just a species of that. Um, was this just inevitable, do you think, Ben, that the entertainment industry would finally come in and say, sorry, got to do something about the VPNs? I mean, I think um, I, I should I should I should uh, expose a personal interest here is that I have I have uh, VPN my way to a lot of BBC Doctor Who stuff that's not available in the United <laughs> States. Yeah. So I, I you know, if the BBC is listening, it wasn't me. Pay no attention. Um, <laughs> but if, <laughs> Uh, these are not the droids you're looking for, right. but, um, so I, I just, I think it's, I think your, your use of the word inevitable is probably the right one. Uh, mm -hmm. this was a problem. They, the, the copyright holders, the entertainment industry and, and not, you know, I don't want to come off as totally against, you know, copyright holders. I, I, a lot of my clients are copyright holders. A lot of us on this conversation are copyright holders. Um, they want to control and protect their interests and there's nothing wrong with that. And they want to limit what they make available and where they make it available. Also, nothing wrong with that. This seems a little bit seems a little bit heavy-handed. Uh, it seems a little bit uh, oppressive, but it's not unexpected. I mean, if if once it became a sufficiently widespread activity to pretend you were in New York when really you were in Australia, then someone who wanted to control that, someone who wanted to say, "Okay, I only want it in New York and not in Australia." They're going to come in and say we need we need a way to stop this. They're approaching it by going to the major legal providers. I think that's actually good because, like the existence of Hulu, the existence of Netflix, the existence of legal options to otherwise illegal, you know, and and ethically questionable activities like streaming, downloading, illegal downloading, things like that. Um, those are those. I I personally I think as a as a matter of sort of policy. I want to encourage them. I want to encourage those options. Um, and so, you know, going to them and saying, look, this is the deal. We'd like you to help us stop this instead of turning around and let's say suing Netflix because they were making something available overseas or instead of chasing down the individual end users, which is, you know, see the RIA cases and and that nightmare. I think yeah. it's the better, the better way to go about it. Technically, I don't know how it's going to work. I mean, right now they can spot what's a VPN Right now, they can spot a VPN, uh, you know, IP address, but at at some point, someone more clever than I is going to come up with a mechanism by which you can adequately mask that without choking the onion, net, you know, the onion routers or something, so so that it will be technically more difficult. But that's just the the sort of traditional whack-a-mole game that any content provider has to eventually play. Right, and and this comes down to, you know, sort of jockeying between Netflix and the entertainment industry as to how much assistance Netflix is going to give them and how much credence um, there, Netflix will give the idea that VPNs equal bad and or illegal conduct. Of course, there are all kinds of perfectly valid ways you can use right. VPN and businesses do it all the time. Um, and, and lots of individuals do it all the time for perfectly legal and valid reasons. So, uh, you know, to, to get a company of the scope and reach of Netflix to buy into the fact that we're going to block VPN access to the service is sort of a staggering idea. Um, Colin, any thoughts on this? I, I think this was inevitable. You know, Ben used the term whack-a-mole, like you, we could say cat and mouse. This seems just part of the game uh, that goes on between folks that try to... Uh, I don't think anybody's arguing that folks that are using the VPN improperly who wouldn't otherwise subscribe to Netflix have a right to that. Uh, um, but that doesn't mean that people aren't going to try and have a lot of fun trying to evade that. I don't... I'm not sure I agree with what I heard you say that you think this is going to sort of spell uh, bad news for VPNs generally. It seems pretty connected to the to the 
you know, the content that's being delivered. I, I don't know though. Right. I, I don't think it would, it would do away with VPNs. Like, sorry if that's how that came across, but, um, but to, I do think that there, there's almost sort of a, how do I phrase this? It's, it's, it's perhaps overreaching by a private company to say, you may access our service, um, if we can adequately identify uh, your IP address and where it is emanating from. Um, you know, I mean, I suppose private companies can make that kind of decision, uh, just like private companies can make the decision to plant an album uh, uh. on... <laughs> Again, I don't know how many people were impacted. I was not personally, and I'm mystified as to why I was not, because I actually checked, and I have automatic downloads selected in iTunes, and I have a whole plethora of iDevices, but I did not wind up with the U2 album. I don't know, you know, what fortuitously let me off the hook there, uh, but I, I do think that this is a fascinating development because of the way that it of course, there was nothing illegal about what Apple did here. And if you read the terms of service in great microscopic detail and had the time to um, go through however uh, 40 or 50 pages uh, of very small text it would take to do that, um, I, I'm sure that uh, Apple and you too didn't do anything that could uh, be a legal issue for them. Uh, but people were so taken aback by having something they did not ask for show up on their device that Professor James Grimmelman, wonderful, wonderful thinker and writer, uh, you know, took the time to weigh in on it and say, you know, you really, you really got to think about this because people's expectations of how a service is going to work are going to be jarred. And it, start, it becomes sort of a, pseudo contractual thing, what you can do, what you can uh, do to people's devices without their consent. You're, you know, the whole story is remind, uh, reminds me and has reminded a lot of journalists of um, uh, the disappearance of 1984 from Kindles that happened last year or the year before. So um, uh, this I thought was, was fairly interesting, uh, certainly topical this week. Ben? I mean, I don't have, well, actually, I just want to really quickly go back to VPNs. There are a lot of good uses for VPNs that are not mm. about faking faking where you are or or somehow tricking people. I just want to make it clear that I don't think that all VPN usage is is uh, is you know for some sort of nefarious purpose. Um, that said, I don't have a lot to add to to what you just said in the Laboratorium article. I think they both speak to something more, something slightly broader, which is that we as consumers of internet services, whatever that is we have a conception of how things work and when you know when the facts sort of bump into that conception that's when we as we i am saying we but when i you know i am bothered and i don't know exactly what's bothering me i didn't get the youtube album i have an android device i i feel uh, <laughs> i feel very privileged I, I i always feel as as many android device users will will like we have a sort of constant feeling of well oh, we're better than you but, um, <laughs> you know, we're sheep for not being sheep. Separate discussion. Right. Uh, but, you know, this actually, it, 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 your segue was perfect because it, it dovetails very nicely with, you know, with the VPN thing. We, we think of we're getting a service and, you know, we use the magical intertubes and we get to that service and we want it to be neutral. We want net neutrality and that because that's the way we think of it and we want it to be you know, not entirely caring about where the origin point of my computer is, because that's sort of what VPNs do at some level. They make, they make your computer think that my computer is somewhere else. Um, and we want our stuff to be left alone. And those are all sort of social conceptions that we have built up, social constructions that we've built. And when they get, when they get violated, it's very troublesome to us. It's, it's something that businesses have to remind themselves all the time of, even if it's not, it's more an ethical and public relations and user experience issue than it, than it might be a legal one. 
Um, although, you know, you, if you got enough lawyers in a room, you could start to have a discussion about when somebody's messing with your device, there, there are ways uh, to um, go after them legally. Uh, I don't know that this would rise to that, but, um, you know, even here at uh, This Week in Law, we, we had our own U2 moment with our very first episode of the show. And we, we didn't even realize, we just sort of backed into it. And maybe that's what happened to Apple here. Uh, Twit, our flagship show on the Twit Network, This Week in Tech, uh, was dark that week, the week that we recorded the first episode of This Week in Law. And so we all decided, hey, you know, no one's going to get Twit in their RSS feed. Thousands and thousands of people uh, subscribe to Twit. No one's going to get it this week. Let's give them this week in law. So we did. <laughs> and it, uh, it upended lots of people's expectations. What the heck is this? We've never heard of this. I think we were fighting back from the backlash of, you know, oh, I've heard this show. It came to me instead of Twit <laughs> for, for weeks, if not months after that. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think that people just stumble and move on and maybe that's what happened with Apple here. And it, it bears reminding that upending users' expectations is one of the worst things you can do as a business. Uh, Colin, anything to wrap this up? Let's not uh, let Bono... Uh, or bonehead O off the hook here either. I mean, I think uh, <laughs> he should have. He should have been. The whole band should have been thinking a little bit better. And I think the the expectations point is is a good one to end on. People think they're being creative. They think they're being innovative. And to the user, it feels just creepy. And maybe creepy is not illegal, but it's just not smart to do. You don't want your sort of devices uh, anticipating too many of your moves. Though you like it if they anticipate some. Right. Hey, we have another story where we can talk about expectations and things that feel creepy or illegal, but, but may not be. And this one involves Yelp and a pretty significant Ninth Circuit decision. Uh, let me pull it up. I have not uh, committed the name of the case to memory yet. Uh, and it came out a few weeks ago. We've been waiting to talk about it. Uh, but the um, crux of the decision... Uh, were various businesses. I think there were um, perhaps several plaintiffs uh, and they uh, were put off uh, by the fact that Yelp wanted them to advertise, uh, you know, on the Yelp site and uh, came to them and said, we can um, do some things to help you if you advertise with us. Uh, we can surface positive reviews, uh, order negative reviews in a way that they have less impact, et cetera. But if you don't advertise with us, um, then perhaps you're not going to get that kind of treatment. So they were um, sued for various claims, uh, some of which are still pending, including false advertising and securities fraud. But the one that Yelp won a big victory on was extortion. Uh, right. The plaintiffs may be overreached and said, you know, we had to pay this money or they were going to kill our business. Um, and, Yelp, you know, it's a testament to how important uh, Yelp has become to driving business to um, all kinds of industries. Uh, but the extortion claim got knocked out by uh, the Ninth Circuit. And uh, it's, it's notable that there was also um, a Section 230 uh, discussion in the trial court. This is the provision that insulates uh, companies like Yelp from the illegal, some of the illegal uh, actions of their users. Uh, the trial court thought that that was an important thing to consider here. The district court didn't, or I'm sorry, the um, appellate court did not at all and, and simply just threw out the extortion claim and found that that was um, not going to fly. So it's given um, some security to businesses like Yelp that you know, while they still have to engage in fair business practices and may have other ways that they can be liable for manipulating what they do uh, to people who are featured on their site, uh, that extortion is going to be hard to find. Uh, so, Ben, do you have anything to add to this? You got an awful nice podcast here, Denise. It would be a shame <laughs> if something happened to it, like a fire or something. <laughs> I think that will be terrible. 
Um, Did I, I mention that Ben's in New Jersey? That's right, exactly. <laughs> um, yes. Now everything goes black. Right. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it seems that... I'm, I'm of two minds. Yelp is a business. Yelp is doing what... Uh, Yelp is not doing anything that it did not say it was going to be doing. Yelp is very open, and it says these are the reviews. There is a concern because I don't think Yelp makes it clear to the end client, to the users of Yelp, that we, that Yelp um, will up, will upvote or downvote to use the, the wrong language, but will, will, you know, move around the reviews. I go to Post. Yelp, I'm assuming I'm getting a, 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 a fair and representation. Wins the reviews I'm is the language the court uses. So of course, sorry, posting them, say? posting and sequencing them. So the, 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 opportunity on Yelp's part, both to make something available on its site at all, and then how you're going to present it on the site. Posting and sequencing Posting is what, and sequencing. Uh, yes, what the court well, said. Well, I think the, I mean, right to do. there's nothing in, there's nothing clearly available as an end user. I don't know that Yelp is doing the, the posting and sequencing decision making. My assumption, and it's an assumption, and I'm just an end user, I'm not, you know, I have no privity in here in, in this situation, but my assumption is that Yelp is posting reviews sort of neutrally. And that is, I think, I think, you know, as you correctly, correctly say, that's an assumption and that's an expectation that I have as an end user. Um, but that's nowhere in the contract and that's nowhere in the rules. Uh, that, that this tension as to, you know, what a private company can do and how it, how it plays with, uh, how it plays with the expectations is, is, is a theme. In this case, I think at the end of the article that you um, that you posted, that you linked to, uh, there's a mention of an FTC complaint from from end users. I think that's where, if something happens to fix this, which I perceive as a problem, if something happens to fix this problem, it's going to happen on that side. And at some level, Yelp and companies like that are, I don't want to say deceiving, but they're they are creating some sort of confusion on, on the consumer side as to the unbiased nature of the um, of the reviews as to the as to the, the neutrality of the reviews. I know that in um, in the search engine world, right? So uh, search engines have sponsored links and 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 organic links, and there are constant pushes, constant tensions, and constant sort of battles over exactly where the line is drawn in terms of identifying what is um, what's a sponsor link and what's not. What the color has to be. What the what the, does it have to be a line? Does it have to be a different colored link? Does it have to be a different style link? Does it have to say sponsored ad or not? Those, that's, that's the direction I would see this conflict going in general. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't necessarily know that, that throwing the extortion claim out completely was the right decision, but I am not on the circuit court and, and no one has called me yet. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, and I made you put your phone away before the show, so that's right. you're going to have to check when we're all done. It depends on who's um, watching the podcast. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a really good insight and that there are very strong parallels between um, search results, which is how people used to find businesses and and decide who was going to get their business before sites like Yelp um, and the information that you now get from a Yelp or a ripoff report or, or somebody else who's, um, you know, in the business of making sure that consumers, uh, you know, the way these business these businesses sort of package themselves is if you're a consumer, we're going to make sure you get the best business. We're going to see, you're going to see the reviews. You're going to see the stars. You're looking for the best plumber in your area. You're going to see the plumber that everyone loves. And, uh, you know, I have picked plumbers based on that and they've been very good. I mean, the system seems to work. There is a trust relationship that gets developed over time when you actually have used the service, found someone great, perhaps posted your own review that, you know, boosts that up or, you know, if you've had a bad experience. So I, I do think that um, legislators will be concerned with the quality of the kind of data that is presented on those kinds of sites. And that, well, I, you know, th this is not the end of that, this story. I think, I think in the case of the review, however, it's actually, it's a stronger case because, mm -hmm. uh, Reviews don't work unless I'm seeing all the reviews. It doesn't. You're, the actual there's an actual disconnect between what you say you're giving me if you're if you are a review site, and you say you're giving me sort of reviews, and and if you're not giving me sort of an unbiased 
sampling other views, then you're actually undermining the value of even the ones you do give me. Uh, yeah. it, it, more than in search and more than in other things, because in the review thing, it's exactly right. You're picking a plumber. You're looking for stars. If I see a four-star plumber, a five-star plumber, I don't know how many stars are on Yelp. I assume five stars, right? So if I see a five-star plumber and I'm very excited, it undermines the value of that five-star plumber. If there's another plumber that's also a five-star plumber, but he's not on that page because he didn't pay Yelp, that's that's going to work against what I think I'm getting when I go to Yelp and what I rightfully think I'm getting when I go to Yelp and what Yelp has told me it's giving me. And that's where the, the, the regulation should or could come in. It's it's going to be dangerous because of unintended consequences, but I think that's the direction it needs to go. Well, and I think we'll see this, as you pointed out, Ben, the similar arguments made to what the search companies have always said, hey, we're a private company. We can present results however we'd like. And you know, at some point, regulators and legislators have come in and said, no, you're, you know, you are the gateway to the the world's information. And there are some responsibilities that go along with that. Uh, Colin, do you see us headed in that direction with review services? Well, uh, if you don't mind me switching the conversation ever so slightly, because the, mm -hmm. the case involved two separate allegations. We've been talking about the hosting and sequencing, and the, mm -hmm. the Ninth Circuit said that there was no extortion here. This was just economic hardball. You can do it. And some of the policy mm -hmm. questions you've sort of been getting into. But as a civil procedure professor, I just have to talk about the other allegation, which involved the idea that Yelp employees were actually writing negative reviews and using those negative reviews as part of this extortion scheme scheme or what they were calling an extortion scheme. Mm -hmm. And the appellate court rejected that on uh, on Iqbal Twombly grounds, which is the, the 12B6, the pleading standard. And I thought their reasoning in that part of the opinion was outrageous and shows you the, the danger of those decisions. Uh, to get a little bit in the weeds, um, one of the plaintiffs was a, a, a pet kind of store that does stuff for animals called cats and dogs. And mm -hmm. they got two negative reviews that they thought were just terrible. And one of the negative reviews came from somebody that turned out to be a real person, Chris R. And the mm -hmm. other negative review uh, was from, you know, Kate K. And Cats and Dogs said this Kate K. review was written by Yelp and uh, and it's destroying our business and it's terrible. And and they're only going to get rid of it if we uh, you know pay for advertising. And what the court said was that it's not plausible that the Kate K. review was written by Yelp. And they said that there's no specific allegation to show that. Uh, however, what uh, cats and dogs were able to plead was that Yelp employees had spoken about writing reviews uh, many hundreds of times, including to the New York Times. It was a matter of public record. And the court said, well, there's nothing specific to connect it here. And uh, again, as a civil procedure professor, I thought that's exactly what discovery is for. Yeah. We, the plaintiffs should at least have had the right to find out anything they knew about, you know, Kate K. Uh, and I, th because the court didn't say it, but I'm, I'm quite confident that if the Yelp employees had actually written that negative review and that was part of this scheme, that goes beyond just the regular hardball that they said uh, Yelp has every right to play. So at just this decision kind of outside the realm of uh, tech and into the broader question of pleadings and what do plaintiffs have to do in order to get to discovery to find out if somebody has wronged them. I found this to be a troubling, troubling case because they, they had very specific allegations that show Yelp has actually done this before. And just because they didn't have a, a specific enough one here, I don't see how they possibly could have had it without discovery. Right. And for our listeners who are not lawyers, that means that they, they don't even have the opportunity on that claim to go forward and try and prove it, to do discovery and, and see what they can learn uh, about Yelp's tactics along those lines and what specifically happened here. Um, that claim is just out of the case and they're not allowed to pursue it anymore. So yeah, that's a really good point and, and does seem like um, maybe was uh, a step too far on the part of the court. Uh, can, you, can you give us... Colin, uh, the court's justification for saying they didn't meet, you know, the pleading standards are very lenient. You just basically have to sketch out, have a 
Oh, well, why don't you give us a standard? You're the civil procedure yeah, <laughs> professor. Yeah, what well, do you, you have know. to put in a complaint to have it pass muster so people know? I'll tell you what, there's a map for that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I've, uh, the civil procedure pleadings doctrine has changed quite a lot in the past few years. Uh, back in 2007, the Supreme Court handed down a case called Twombly, which involved a giant antitrust allegation that essentially said all of the baby bells were uh, involved in antitrust. And the court said, we can't let this case go to discovery. Uh, it would just involve, you know, essentially looking at the records of every single person who had a phone over 10 years in the United States. It was just too big. And in so doing, they said, it's not just that regular notice standard. You have to state a claim that's plausible. And then in a case that followed up a couple of years later, uh, Iqbal, they, they, uh, expanded upon that. And now the standard is that uh, you have to show that your claim is not just conceivable, that it's plausible. And judges are directed to evaluate plausibility given their own common sense and context, which is a wide, wide open standard. So what the court did in this case is it said, um, if you look at common sense, if the first person was a real person who wrote that review, then the second person who wrote that review um, is also a real person. And they said that's just common sense and that's just the context. And uh, I think that is not at all common sense. It's not common sense to me, but that's the precise danger with the new pleadings standard that we have is that it gives too much license for judges if they, if they just don't see it to hap happening. Uh, they think it's not probable, they can justify dismissing a suit, not allowing it going to discovery, even though they're not supposed to. The court has also said, the Supreme Court has also said, this isn't a probability requirement. Judges aren't supposed to decide whether they think it's likely or not, but they've given them this out, which the court took in this case, that's it's disturbing. All right, isn't we really it? appreciate your analysis on that front. I'm sorry, Ben, I cut you off. No, no, it's I, isn't it the case though under under the Iqbal Tombly uh, standard that that they still have to take all the allegations as if true, uh, all the allegations as if true. I mean, I, I'm Colin, I'm asking. Yeah, no, that's, I don't know. I, that's absolutely right. So, so what the court did is it took the allegation that Yelp has uh, confessed to writing fake reviews in other cases as true. But that didn't lead to that didn't permit the inference, according to the court, that they did it in this case. That that wow. inference was still implausible. All right. Uh, so definitely, there's a lot uh, to come. I think on on the front of what review sites can and cannot do, and and what tactics are going to pass muster, and and what people are going to be able to um, talk about in court, even if they're going to be able to get past the initial phase of filing a complaint and get into trying to prove that uh, really bad tactics are happening. Um, let's end the show on a copyright note. We've talked a lot about the monkey selfie case. Every copyright interested lawyer uh, anywhere on the planet has talked a lot about the monkey selfie case. We've probably talked too much about the monkey selfie case, but um, it's so fun. And I had to just um, highlight on the show because I have not yet done so, that if you are as charmed by the whole monkey selfie situation as we all have been in past months, uh, that there's actually a um, 3D printed version of the macaque in question uh, that is available from Shapeways. Uh, some enterprising person over there has uh, now added yet another twist to the various copyright ins and outs of who owns the copyright to the picture uh, taken with the photographer's camera by the monkey itself. And now who gets to profit from the 3D printed version available for $15 on Shapeways. Um, that is just so cute too. Uh, so I bring it up because Ben, you weighed in on this on the, uh, over on a comment on the likelihood of confusion blog. So I wanted to get your take uh, on the whole question because even the copyright office at this point has weighed in. Well, it's the you, copyright office weighed in. Right. Do you right. agree with them or not? Well, I think, I mean, the copyright office, they weighed in in, in a in a 2,000-page document about the copyright, various copyright procedures. And somewhere on, somewhere I think it's like the 50th or 60th page, they mention 
what can and cannot be copyrighted or what cannot, can and cannot be considered authored. And they mentioned specifically a photograph taken by a monkey. I actually think that they weighed in um, too soon. I think they, they may have oversimplified matters. Uh, if you look at the comments on that likelihood of confusion posting, um, there was a post over at a blog called Duet's Blog that I really think spoke to the issue. Um, I'm not going to recap my comment. That con it, it's, it's interesting. It's very interesting for copyright lawyers. Um, probably not so interesting for anybody else. It's a lot of fun to think about, though, this monkey taking a picture of himself. This statue, however, is a, is a law professor's. I mean, it's awesome for a law professor. There is case <laughs> law. There's very strong case law that um, you make a statue from a picture. There's a Coons case, a case involving Jeff Coons, um, where you make a statue from a picture. That is essentially a derivative work of that. Of that from that picture so the author of the picture the, the photographer in this case nobody it seems to be determined i also think it's nobody um has some rights and then the statue itself but then the question becomes how much of a slavish reproduction of a of a simply trying to be accurate to the facts in the world is the statue of as opposed to the the photograph and and so the the person who developed the monkey selfie statue pete Bosdale, it seems like, whoever developed this sort of set of instructions to create a statue from the, the picture, they actually have added a layer of copyright, uh, copyright, copyright complexity. Um, sure. They it's, have it's, it's CAD really, files and 3D designs. Exactly. And the CAD files yes. doesn't describe a 3D object, which is itself yes. subject to copyright. So it's a sculpture that's subject to copyright that is a derivative work of a photograph that would normally be subject to copyright. But isn't because of the the way I come down on it is the lack of agency on the part of the monkey, um, which is a <laughs> sentence I never thought I would say when I went to law school. <laughs> um, but there you have it. I think it's I think it's you know it's fascinating. It's a lot of fun. I will be getting yeah. a statue. I'll totally be getting one of the monkey statues. It's going to go in my office. And, right. um, I'm very excited and just, for that. Just to be sure we're clear on your position. There is no copyright in this photograph. Correct. The, 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 yeah, the question of the copyright in the photograph. Actually, I, I mean, it, it is worth thinking. The, the question of any kind of these these sort of in, uh, attenuated co co copyright creation claims, um, excuse the alliteration, um, is always is is in my opinion is a question of agency. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the 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 classic case is a painter takes his paintbrush and puts the picture on, puts the paint on the canvas, and there's no question that it's the painter that is making the choices as, that, that eventually express themselves in the work. But with a lot of art, forget about, you know, with photography, with, with computer generated art, with, with a lot of music now, a lot of things, there's no longer that direct connection. And so copyright authorship has to, has to be, uh, has to reflect some sort of core value. And, and I think what that core value is, is the, is the choices that the author or artist makes. So, you know, if I set up a photo, if I set up a camera to take motion, motion triggered photographs and a monkey walks by and he triggers that photograph, there's a, you know, that I think is clearly a case where I do have the copyright in that, in that photograph. Whereas when the monkey takes the, the picture itself, uh, you know, I don't think it exists there. And I think that the, the critical issue is agency. At some level, I have made the monkey an agent of my will by having it be motion detected, as opposed to in this case, from what is described and it's, you know, we're going, we're, all of this discussion is based on, you know, one blog post and one, one sort of ex post analysis by the photographer of what he did and what he didn't do. In right. that case, from what I see, I don't think the monkey was an agent of the photographer. So yeah, I don't think that this, this photograph is, is subject to copyright, but that's, you know, reasonable minds may differ. All right, and Toad Sloth offers a solution in IRC that the monkey should just incorporate and then it will have rights that otherwise maybe it might not have, hearkening <laughs> back apparently, to these apparently recent enough, Supreme, Supreme Court decisions. There's enough interest in this that there might be some money there. So if the monkey would like to contact me, I think my information is at the bottom. And, uh, there we go. <laughs> hey, speaking of Supreme Court decisions, recent and otherwise, Although Colin is busy teaching and studying and doing all kinds of wonderful, great things that don't involve mapping the Supreme Court, one of the most interesting things he's involved with is the Supreme Court Mapping Project. And that is going to be our resource of the week this week. 
Colin, uh, we have a bit of video I think we could play to tee this up, and then we'll let you explain more about it, if that makes sense. Sure. Okay, uh, if we can Which roll Which that. video? I haven't been told which video you're going to play, so. Uh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. It's the Vimeo video that, can you see it on the oh, screen yeah, now right, before yeah, it plays? Sure. Yeah, X yeah, yeah, axis so. plots the date of an opinion. That's the, uh, that's the civil well, procedure. That's the one explaining the, the exact doctrine I was talking about. Opinions pleading standard. Right. The higher on the y-axis, the more liberal the pleading standard in that opinion. We'll also show, via arrows, the citations of one decision to another, with a green arrow representing a positive citation that follows the cited case, and a yellow arrow representing one ahead that little. limits the cited case or <laughs> calls it into question. Triangles okay. represent cases where a claim was found insufficient and dismissed under Rule 12b-6. Upward All right, but maybe we'll uh, we'll take a break here and was sufficient as a matter. skip up a bit, and we'll let you we'll let you uh, talk for a bit. You just go. you know, again, bearing in mind that a lot of the people that uh, listen to the show are not lawyers. Um, certainly, the Supreme Court is in the business of making lots of interesting data available. It it writes lengthy, lengthy opinions with concurrences and dissents. And they all have an impact on how the law develops and is applied. Um, and you're trying to make some uh, quantitative sense of that data. Can you tell us how it works? So there's a few different types of maps that I have. But the basic idea is to um, lawyers often speak about lines of cases. And I wanted to take that notion of a line and make it literal. But when it comes to the Supreme Court, there's a fiction. The court, all majority opin opinions are written by the court as if there's no author. Uh, everyone knows that there is an author, but they later on refer to it as the court did this in Citizens United or the court did that in Maryland versus King. Uh, but of course, as you pointed out, there are often dissents, there are concurring opinions. And the reason why we have dissents and concurring opinions is because the justices are jockeying about trying to change the law. So the main or original idea behind the mapping project was to try to tease out the competing lines within a doctrine. So you might have a, a Fourth Amendment doctrine around uh, you know, whether or not you need a warrant. And there's certain majority opinions that would suggest that you don't need a warrant. And there's other majority opinions that would suggest that you do. And then there's dissenting opinions in the other cases that are kind of flying the flag of those competing schools. And so what I've done is uh, work on a way I've uh, got a visualization tool working with Darren Kumasawa, um, uh, an old high school friend of mine who continues to be a, a computer programmer. We've got a visualization tool that lets you uh, plot competing lines of opinions. And then we've also been working on a mapping library that shows lots of different areas of doctrine using the schema that we're talking about. So you're showing the video from a, um, a, a, a line about pleadings doctrine, which we were just talking about before, Iqbal and Twombly. It's a video I did with uh, Professor Scott Dodson over at UC Hastings, uh, who is an expert in the area of civil procedure much more than, more than I am. And we trace how that doctrine has developed. And, uh, and I'm currently involved in, you know, before the first Monday in October, there'll be a new release of the mapper that has new uh, types of maps that combine it with the Supreme Court database, the so-called SPATH database, and uh, plot decisions using their methodology, which a lot of empirical scholars in the court use. So it's a it's a project that both has a, a visualization element and a substantive element about different doctrinal areas of the court. And its goal is to help people have a more nuanced understanding of what's going on, that it's not just the monolithic court doing things, rather it's opinions that have authors staking out positions that are more or less controversial. And uh, the basic visualization will let you see whether it's a very controversial case of five to four or a, a quite a unanimous case, nine to zero. You can see that instantaneously using the tool. Well, and also I think would be interesting to anyone who's developing a Supreme Court fantasy football league where you were try, you know, you were all about trying to ballpark where uh, a decision was going to go. Um, of course, we don't know until the decision comes out who's going to author what, but uh, it certainly gives you a lot of insight into the court that uh, you might not have if you didn't look at the mapper. I'm looking at your mapper library now. 
Um, and there are lots of broad topics like the Fifth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, same-sex marriage, uh, right to privacy, uh, the origins of Roe versus Wade. That would be an interesting one to delve into. Um, so is your goal to just uh, continue doing this on the big issues that come before the court or all the issues that come before the court? It's I'm moving to I wouldn't go to all the issues, but more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the 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 next generation of the mapper, which, as I said, is going to be released fairly soon, ha, is mm -hmm. doing an automated network analysis. The prior one was very the current version, let's say, is very dependent upon the user doing all the reading his or her self. And uh, that's a laborious process. Uh, and so kind of the idea of computer assisted network generation is what I'm working on now to give users uh, a quick snapshot of what's going on to be able to locate uh, the key dissents or the key majority opinions that are hubs in larger networks. So uh, we're using the, 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 we're using kind of a six degrees of Kevin Bacon algorithm connecting <laughs> two, two cases to each other over time. Well, it's really, really cool. Super ambitious. Uh, love that you're doing it. Uh, for anyone else that wants to dive in and see what's there, and uh, yeah, do you have some sort of uh, way that people can help you with the project? Yeah, I, I allow you know users to use the software, and uh, mm -hmm. in fact, I've just managed to get representation from the uh, the Software Freedom Law Center, I believe, so to get up some licensing agreements. But the, the basic idea is that it's free for people to use. Uh, exactly how that works out hasn't been done. So I'm, look, uh, I'm looking for people to contribute to the library, people that were interested in using the tool. Uh, it's not quite ready to go, but you know, in two or three weeks, I should be there. Very cool. Um, it's available at the University of Baltimore Law School site. It's got kind of a lengthy URL. So I would suggest that you go to delicious.com slash thisweekinlaw slash 276 because it is there along with everything else that we've been discussing today. Or, you know, you could just Google SCOTUS Mapper because that's going to bring you there too. Um, and I have a tip of the week for you. It's kind of a twofold tip of the week. It has to do with Facebook and it sort of resonates with uh, a couple of the stories we've uh, discussed on the show today, dealing with trust and expectations. And uh, the first one is, you know, this definitely made the social media rounds. Um, I'm hoping lots of you already saw it. Uh, if not, I wanna highlight it for you because it was a fascinating experiment that a Dutch student named Zilla van den Born, uh, if I'm saying her name correctly, uh, conducted. And, and what she did, and again, the reason this worked is because she's posting things to her Facebook page and she's an individual. She's not a corporation. She is not sponsored in any way. This was an academic exercise she went about uh, at the suggestion of one of her professors, I believe. And what she decided to do was fake her Southeast Asia vacation. She never left Amsterdam, but she went around to restaurants and Buddhist temples and riding around in taxi cabs with Asian drivers and <laughs> jumped in the pool at her apartment and photoshopped in some fish. And uh, it was just a brilliant, brilliant uh, exercise. Not even her parents knew that she was not in Southeast Asia as she did this. And she did it to point out that uh, it's very possible uh, without too much effort to entirely mislead people uh, with social media. And I think, you know, her point was was that all the, I don't know about you guys, but um, every one of my Facebook friends lives a far more dramatic and exciting and, and glorious life than I do uh, based on all of their photographs and adventures. Um, and I think that, that was part of her point is that, you know, take it with a grain of salt when your friends are off on these fabulous trips. <laughs> and, and I think the other point to be drawn here is, is just that, you know, when you have someone's trust to the extent that you do in a relationship as you do with friends on Facebook, um, it's really possible to pull the wool over their eyes. And, and I think that goes to uh, why it's so important that the FTC has disclosure guidelines that we were discussing earlier, um, when you have to very clearly disclose um, what is sponsored and by whom. Uh, and uh, so that that is part of the tip. Part of the tip is to um, 
take what you see on Facebook with a grain of salt. The uh, second part two of the tip has to do with how durable that information is. Uh, Facebook is rather notorious for not making uh, your posts searchable in a useful way. It all sort of streams down uh, people's news feeds and, and your page and uh, then becomes difficult to find when you go and you use Facebook search. For example, my father is interested in a stand-up desk. He's having some back problems. Uh, he is not working in the tech industry in Silicon Valley, uh, as you might guess from the notion of having a stand-up guest, Tom Fransky, desk. Tom Fransky did a really funny article about how the stand-up desk is the new Aeron chair, but I digress. Um, my dad wants a stand-up desk. I think Evan, if we, we had him here today, we're still missing him, um, uses a stand-up desk these days, which is because good for your posture, uh, helps you uh, stay engaged and uh, avoids back problems. Um, so I know that Robert Scoble uh, just recently got this fabulous new stand-up desk and he loves it. And I, to assist my father, really wanted to find the name of the specific desk that he was using. Impossible to do during Facebook, uh, using Facebook search now. But Facebook has been testing a way that one's Facebook friends uh, or anyone with access to that particular post might be able to search them in the future. Right now, they've been testing it on mobile um, and, you know, still very limited release and not available to um, the general public at all. But it's it's something, it's as I think it was Gawker or one of, uh, maybe not Gawker, Engadget said, this one's a no-brainer. <laughs> you know, why haven't they done it yet? But it is, it is coming and uh, in the news recently is how they have been testing that on mobile. So, uh, Facebook data is getting both uh, more searchable, hopefully in the near future, and you need to be careful about taking it literally because someone might be faking their Southeast Asia vacation. That was a rather long tip, but I thought both those stories were um, interesting and worth highlighting. And uh, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up the show. Sorry, Evan, we missed you so much. And you're not going to see Evan or me next week because we're going to be dark next week. Both Evan and I have scheduled conflicts on the 26th, but we will see you the week after that. And I just, uh, you know, even without our Evan, who keeps me on track and has so many brilliant things to say, this has been such a fun show. I've really appreciated meeting you, Ben. Uh, ben got in touch, and this is a good cautionary tale for you. I always encourage people to get in touch with me uh, after the shows if they have a comment or something to say. But if I decide that you're an interesting IP lawyer, I'm probably going to ask you on the show. And that's what happened to Ben. Um, he got drag dragooned into coming on the show. I, ha uh, I have to say that I, I am a, I, I said it in the email and I'll say it again. I'm a tremendous fanboy here. I'm I've been I've been trying to squash it down. I've been you know listening to the pod, listening. I listen mostly on audio, don't watch. So I've been listening to the show for for a while, and I was very excited to get the email. I was really it was a squee worthy moment. It was tremendous. <laughs> squee! I'm so glad that you could join us. It's been really fascinating talking with you, and I'm sure that we'll have the opportunity to do so again. If like Ben, you want to, you know, I forget Ben. You were what did you get in touch with me about? It was something it, it, you. Were it was the circuit split on the uh, the registration requirement yes. on the copyrights. I was That's actually right. tip of the week for 274, I think. You were indeed. <laughs> That's right. Um, it's going on my website as a, as a badge of honor. Good. So if you want to follow in Ben's footsteps, please do get in touch with us between the shows. I'm Denise at twit.tv. Evan is Evan at twit.tv. You can find us both on Twitter. I'm uh, D. Howell there. Evan is internet cases there and uh, go find our Facebook and Google Plus pages too because that's where you can communicate with us, you know, in more than 140 characters. That's always good too. Uh, and also Colin Starger, it has just been a joy chatting with you. I'm so interested in your mapping project and in all of the work that you're doing at the University of Baltimore School of Law. It's just been a pleasure. It's been wonderful for me to be on the show. I've really enjoyed meeting you and uh, and Ben. It's a great, great, great topics for discussion. Really interesting. Before I let our guests go, I always just check in with them and see if there's anything hot on their agenda they want to let people know about before we sign off and get out of here. Uh, Colin, anything going on at the school or um, any particular things with the SCOTUS mapper? I know you have the new uh, uh, library coming out soon. 
Yeah, new library coming out before the first Monday in October. I think folks should uh, pay attention to the news out of Philadelphia next week. There's going to be an exoneration, uh, I believe, uh, of a guy named Anthony Wright that I was involved in. And uh, I think the story about Pacer taking down a lot of the records uh, might start growing up next week. So that's, uh, that's worth looking at as well. Okay, good to know. Ben, anything on your plate? Uh, I have a couple of sort of popping uh, cases or con client matters that actually I can only discuss in sort of vague hand-waving motion, hand-waving ways. <laughs> but uh, no, I'm, I'm actually, I'm, quite honestly, I'm going to go look at the mapping project and see if I can get involved and help out with that at all. It's, it's brilliant. I think it's fascinating. That's my big thing for this coming week. It is. It's really cool. All right, so we have been recording this show here. We started at 11 o'clock Pacific time, 1800 UTC on a Friday, and that's when we do our shows. So if you'd like to join us live, uh, we hope that you will. It's really fun to have a live audience and uh, jump in chat and give us tips and jokes and everything else. Uh, but if you can't, don't worry about it. We have the whole archive of shows for you too at twit.tv slash twill, at youtube.com slash thisweekinlaw, in iTunes, uh, and hopefully nobody's, you know, uh, CBS is going to keep fighting the good battle about distributing uh, the show in in what one would consider netcast or podcast form. Uh, so we're in all of those forms and uh, on Roku as well. So um, definitely find us in a way that makes sense for you. Use your VPN or not. We don't care. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> do we just love having you come back. We hope you'll do so not next week because we're going to be dark, but the week after that. Uh, by which time it will be October. So we will see you then. Take care.